of how we're going to take some of the input and then go over some of that as well. So, Gloria Houston, our assistant city manager. Wednesday, with tonight being the last meeting, we are going to be collecting input in several ways this evening. You can, you can text your comments. You, you should have received a flyer on how to do that. You can go online and submit them through your website, or we also have comment cards. So this is a way for us to maximize the input we receive. We are going to be gathering all of that, and then we'll be posting all of those questions we receive on all Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the answers to those on a website, which is www.thealamo.org. At the end of the presentation this evening, we will have Councilman Roberto Trevino and Alamo Advisory Committee Member Boris Bias moderate. We'll be going by each of the categories that are submitted. So If there are questions or comments regarding the site plan, we'll be going through those. We will look at each of them. If there is something that's missing, we're happy to take that from the floor. However, we're going to categorize all of them and then go category by category. Site plan, Senate Path, Alamo Plaza, Plaza de Valero. So we'll be going through those. That's a way for us to be able to gather as much input as possible so we can respond to that by Wednesday of next week. Now this is the first of several drafts that we are sharing with the public. So the first draft we've been sharing all week, we are going to send our design team back with all of this input. It will come back with a second draft in July. We will meet with the Alamo Advisory Committee. That meeting will also be public. We'll be presenting that to the committee. And then we'll have four more public meetings. And we'll be sharing the second draft with the public. We will receive comments, and we will go back again for another round. There is no hard and fast deadline of when this will be presented to City Council. What the Mayor and Councilman Trevino and the City Council have said is they have asked that the Advisory Committee endorse a plan before it goes to Council for any consideration. We do not have that scheduled right now. What we do have scheduled is three rounds of public input. This is the first draft of many drafts to come. So I want to make sure that you understand that we are listening, we are collecting input many ways, and if you are not at this meeting, you can submit questions on the alamo.org website as well. But we will be responding to those questions by Wednesday of next week, and we'll be posting the locations for the next public meetings in July and the coming weeks. So with that, I'd like to pass it on to Councilman Roberto Trevino, who will be doing a brief presentation before we hand it on to our design team. Round of applause for Lori Houston, our Assistant City Manager. Thank you, Lori. So I also want to thank uh, some Citizens Advisory Committee members that are here tonight. We have, uh, of course, you already know, Boris Bias, who's here. We have uh, Sharon Swarsak, Aaron Bowman, Ramon Vasquez, Marcelo Martinez, and Philip, Philip Becky. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I have a lot of applause for all of very hard. We're working very hard to, to really work with the design team and, and the management committee. Uh, so, I'd like to provide some background and information on the Alamo Master Plan and project. And as you know, in 2014, the uh, San Antonio City Council established the Alamo Plaza Advisory Committee. It was made up of 21 members appointed by the Mayor and City Council, held 14 public meetings, and in December 11, 2014, adopted the vision and guiding principles, and they were approved by the Mayor and City Council. 
Of course, the vision and guiding the vision, of course, is talking about engaging the local residents and visitors in ways to personally connect to the Alamo experience. And as you can see, there's there's a lot to this vision. And this is something that the, the, the Citizens Advisory Committee worked on very, very diligently. Every word, every every sentence was very, very important to them. So we, we adopted this for this for this project. The guiding principles. The 1836 Battle of the Alamo, the most widely recognized event, will provide the portal in which we enter the, 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 the project and how we begin the preservation and interpretation of the site. Of course, we want to make uh, the site uh, an intellectual experience. This, we want to provide some physical accessibility that, that isn't there right now. We want to balance the scholarship and historical context. And of course, create a premier visitor experience, along with that, embracing the continuum of history. So the master plan in 2015 was the uh, was created with a, in cooperation with the state of Texas, the city of San Antonio, in agreement with with the general land office and the Alamo Endowment. Adopting the vision and guiding principles helped to start the master plan that we're working on today. May of 2017, the City Council took action, approved the Alamo Master Plan and the five key concepts, as you can see here. Restore the Alamo Church in Long Barrett, reestablish clarity and order through the delineation of the historic footprint, recapture the historic Mission Plaza and create a sense of reverence and respect on the historic battlefield, repurpose Crockett Block, Woolworth, and Pal Palace Theater buildings into a world-class visitor center and museum that tells the story of the battle and over 300 years of later history, and create a sense of arrival to the site and enhance connectivity between the site and other public spaces. The comprehensive interpretive plan, which we are in this stage, so the last summer, the management committee put out an RFQ. We've got seven responses. And from that, we narrowed it down to four. PGAB, Destinations, Rehill the Brand, and Cultural Innovations were selected from that, those four interviews. As you can see, they've done extensive work, and this is a well-qualified team that's working on the interpretive plan in this phase of the project. It's an evolving plan, and the comprehensive mass, mass interpretive plan builds on the match plans by key concepts to develop an, an interpretive plan and site strategies. So we're, we're in the public feedback stage, and we're, we're looking to, to engage the community. As Lori said, we, we will have uh, many, many more meetings. Of course, it's an evolving plan, and of course, opinions vary. Build stone walls. Build structural glass walls. Don't build walls. Repair the cenotaph. Disassemble the cenotaph. Relocate the cenotaph. Do not relocate the cenotaph. Add more shade to the Alamo. Close streets. Do not close streets. Uh, this is really important. We're listening, and you can see that there's there's some things that, that we responded to already. So what's the process and the next steps? The first draft was presented to the Alamo Citizen Advisory Committee. Public hearings began this June. And of course, the public meeting will continue through July of this summer. And the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee's committee meetings will continue in the concert with us. And as Lori said, we're going to continue this. We don't have a hard deadline. We want to, we want to make sure that we get this right. As I mentioned, what is so important here is that we, we have something that is a vision and guiding principles guiding all this. And the site interpretive opportunities and site planning strategies are, are very important to us. So we're, we're very happy to have the design team or a couple members from the design team here to present. We have we have uh, John and Doug from the from the design team, and now I'll have um, I'll have John come up here and begin the presentation. And afterwards, we'll we'll begin, we'll begin the, the input process as Lori described. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is John Casman. I'm with PGA Destinations. A uh, little bit of introduction before we get into the chapters that are up there. I wanted, um, as you know, PGA Destinations out of St. Louis, Missouri. We are. Fortunate uh, in that we, we specialize in destinations, not 
uh, not just nationally but internationally. It has to do with uh, everything from national parks to museums, um, Niagara Falls, Grand Canyon. The Alamo, we know, as we started this project with, uh, with the Citizens Advisory Committee, and really all, with all of you, uh, we fully understand this is not just a project that touches the city of San Antonio. We understand it's important to the entire state of Texas. Uh, we understand the impact it has on the country, on the world, and the international crowd. Most importantly, we also understand that's why you guys are all here. It's a story of families. It's a story of generations. Uh, so we do understand that from all the impact we've had, all the listening we've been doing for all the sessions with the Citizens Advisory Committee, all these public sessions we have with you. Uh, so we want to understand it's an honor and a privilege for us to work on this with you, with the Citizens Advisory Council. So with that, we want to share our progress. Uh, we look forward to your feedback. I'm going to start, Doug is going to follow. Uh, I wanted to introduce a little bit of an introductory chapter. So we're going to talk about the vision and the guiding principles uh, Roberto already went through. There's a certain words on here that's, that spoke to us, right? When we talk about personally connecting with the Alamo experience for all of us, right? Not just the, uh, the visitors, but the residents. We talk about memorable experiences, and really a lot of all, all four of these guiding principles, or all four of these uh, vision statements really combined to that. We all want to make three as memorable experiences for your children, for your children's children. Mm -hmm. So we take that, we take these kind of principles, and we use them in different ways. Really, the same way that Roberto started to pick out key words, we started to take these, and we, you're going to see a few slides that follow that talk about how we've interpreted them. We've interpreted them into goals for ourselves, kind of measures of success, if you will. And the first one is our one goal that spoke to us is changing the understanding of the Alamo as a building to the Alamo as a place. And doing that, we think about how we're going to tell the stories throughout the site. Right? Roberto spoke of a museum, and we picture the site also as an open air museum. We think about indoor galleries and outdoor, but also we think about all these stories, all the depth of stories that we're going into, playing to their strengths. Some will be perfect inside the museum galleries. Other ones that you'll see will explain. Uh, we're going to use to tell the stories in the places where they occur, and the visitors, and the sh putting the visitors in the shoes of people that pass. We're going to step just for a few moments in the introduction. A lot of this presentation is really focusing on site planning and site planning strategies. We'll talk a lot of details. A few slides of introduction. This one starts to uh, talk about the collections and talking about how we, we plan on revealing the deeper story in the museum itself and it, the inside of the galleries. So you see on the top, a thought of a chronological approach that covers all, uh, all factors of history. When you think about the mission period all the way back to 1519, think about a gallery that starts in that mission period telling those stories and focusing on that story. So a little separate from a separate gallery that would focus on the Battle of the Alamo and its relation to the overall Texas Revolution story. Third, it's not only about history, it's also, also talking about the relevance of the Alamo to today. That one's called Alamo Ruin to Icon. There's also, you notice in the bottom, you think about the legacy or the legends of the Alamo. That's a separate gallery. We have to admit that there's stories of the Alamo that aren't just deeply rooted in history. It's become part of our culture. So understanding those stories as well, and understanding them separately from the chronology, the chronological story up above is important as well. Important to note, we put it on there, thinking about the pervasive feel throughout this project, right? Alamo is a special place through time. It's a layered story throughout multiple periods of history. With that, we want to get a little snippet of some of the collections. And so up there, we, we organize these slides when you think about it into the separate galleries. When you think about the mission period, we have items that are such as the Spanish point and then upper left-hand corner, but also the Native American pieces. Texas Revolution, you think about Traps of Spring, you think about uh, some cannons, some artillery, a lot of documents that we have that tell the stories, handwritten the stories all the way from back to the Alamo. How do we think about Ruined Icon? We think about uh, not only documents, but periods through time, there's maps, but also there's things. You think about the uh, photo of the Maverick family, there's all those stories that continue on through. We'll speak a little bit. We know the Woolworth, story, the Woolworth building story is important to a lot of folks. 
see that photo in the bottom right hand corner to remind ourselves this, there's some very important things happening on that site as well. So we're also talking about the extension through today. Think about the Legends Gallery, it's not just about the myths of the, of the video and of the movies. There's also some very impactful pieces that we can use in that Legends Gallery that tell different stories, whether they be paintings or other archival pieces that, um, uh, that relate back to the crowd. Those pieces, when you think back, uh, great stories for the museum itself. We also have to think about how those stories are told outside on the site. So you'll see there, it covers all, all factors. You see items number two and, and I can set them up there talking about Native American, American burial grounds at the same time as other, other stories, Long Bear and Church and Forks, but also the story of the Sacred. Main gate you'll see up there, as well as the mission fields and the gardens. Each one of these areas of the site have unique stories that you'll see as we start to use these stories. You'll see when Doug gets up here and talks about the site design. All these layers are important to us and they really guide our site design. They're not just something that is held in the museum. <coughs> this image is important to us as well. When you think about how we think about the museum, think about layers of story over time. We also take that same approach outside. It shows out how the deeper story of the 16th century all the way through today. Those stories are layered throughout the site for the mission period all the way through to today. Finally, it's important to note that we are deeply a deep understanding of the archaeology that's happened already, right? and it will hope to continue as this process evolves. So this also is, has, uh, has been a, a huge factor in the way that we have dealt with our site design. So with that, I'm going to hand the controls and the clicker off to Doug. We're going to go deep, kind of section by section, with some of our site strategies. So this is a lot great for retail brand. Um, I'm Doug Reed, a landscape architect. Um, I practiced here in the San Antonio area for over the last 18 years, and it is indeed a privilege to be back to work on what we know is not only one of the greatest commissions you could receive, but for probably the most important cultural site in this country. Um, thank you. Um, last night I, I opened with a story a personal story um, because I thought it reached into the, the crux of what this project is about. Um, I grew up in southwest Louisiana. Um, I'm Cajun and uh, we came to Texas many times. Um, San Antonio I visited as a child. Um, I came back here as a student of landscape architecture at Louisiana State University. Uh, I returned as a practitioner many times. Uh, I visited the Alamo each time. It wasn't until I returned, and here's the story that I'm a little embarrassed to say, and shame on me. Um, but I returned here uh, for an event at Bracken Ridge Park a year and a half ago. And I visited the Alamo and I visited the missions. And it was the first time in my 60 years of coming here that I had learned the story that the Alamo was more than two buildings. And that it was, in fact, the part of the mission that reaches so deep in American history. And that it was part of a series of missions along the San Antonio River. Um, and so I think this is really the crux of the issue tonight. How, how do we make this place um, tell more of the rich and complex stories of the legacy here, which is so deep and profound? Um, and so really tonight is going to focus on strategies, ideas. It's taking a look at this from almost 10,000 feet. So we really begin, begin to seize the opportunity here of the aspirations uh, for a museum, for educational purposes, um, to um, reinterpret, to interpret and mark um, the great events of the past year. So these were the two overarching goals for us, uh, the team and the committee. Uh, I should say what we are showing tonight is certainly in process, we're still in the planning stage, 
that we're getting ready for coming back to you in uh, July, late July. And um, it reflects the work with so many constituents and stakeholders and the advisory committee and just a lot of great work over the last few months. Um, but this has been an overarching um, goal for us that the make the Alamo a place of reverence and learning at the same time as we improve the Alamo district to be a viable, pedestrian, and friendly, and comfortable civic space. I should explain this. So we were charged with not only looking at the Alamo site, which is defined as the historic mission footprint, but to also look at almost four or five blocks of the surrounding areas that could be improved and should become part of telling the story and setting up the experience of arriving at the Alamo. Um, so there's quite a lot of ambition to this plan and uh, we know that it is both about the experience for the everyday citizen of San Antonio and all the visitors who come here um, so I want to go through how um, we make the Alamo a place of reverence and learning. Do you think there are five things? We think there are five key points here in achieving this vision. One is to clarify the periods of historic significance. So that anyone that comes here understands what they're looking at, where it has come from, uh, what is the sequence of events, um, so that there's real clarity. Uh, reveal and delineate the mission footprint. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, guiding principles and everyone has seemed to rally around the importance of understanding this not as two buildings, but a place. Express the significance of water in the site's history, and for that matter, in the history of the city. Uh, choreograph the approaches to the historic site and develop an accessible, unified, and coherent place. This is the view of the project area that we're going to be using tonight and that we've used in studying it. Uh, so you'll see this over and over again, uh, illustrating the ideas. Um, just to orient you, Kingston Street is toward the uh, north, and the Commerce Street is at the south. You're seeing the Torch of Friendship, and the Alamo and Barracks are represented in brown. One of the ways we've studied this and begun to explore how we achieve this vision is to acknowledge the importance of the original artifacts that remain. So here we're saying that uh, we must emphasize them in this design, uh, but we also have a lot of conservation work to do uh, on the masonry and structural uh, degradation that has happened over time. This also includes the fact that the Alamo um, originally was some 21 inches lower than what it is today, and through settlement, which has happened to a lot of emissions, and through uh, the city um, uh, growing around it, that, um, that 21 inches uh, we need to uh, uh, deal with because that is one of the problems with moisture actually wicking up the building and compromising uh, the uh, stonework. We know that we want to try to recapture and recover the mission push footprint, which is shown here, uh, extending under the federal post office and along the buildings on the west edge. We were interested in this, uh, in the goal to uh, recapture the mission footprint, that what if we were to remove the 20th century elements of the city. By that I mean all of the curves and islands and traffic lights and signs and um, things that were really designed for a vehicle over which buried the plaza and all of the artifacts that were there or what were made 
Um, and so it was interesting to us that you began to see that you could achieve uh, this feeling of the original mission footprint um, by doing this. It also pointed out to us that the Cenotaph, while it's a very powerful and important, significant marker and monument, that the idea that clarifying his history here uh, in making the mission footprint convey the 17th and 18th, I mean 18th and 19th century um, artifacts and heritage, that there was an opportunity for relocating it in order to make for a very significant place in the Palazzo de Valeria. the significance of water in the site's history and we want to uh, address the west edge which we are saying are non-contributing features to the mission footprint but we realize that there's a lot of opportunities and issues here these buildings are currently being fully assessed in terms of their historic integrity and significance we have more to do on that. What we're going to explore tonight is just what are the pros and cons, what are the trade-offs and the opportunities of um, this western edge that are now occupied by buildings from the um, 19th and 20th century. For this purpose, he said, here's what it looks like if they weren't there and if the mission footprint itself had remained through time. And uh, we thought this was very interesting to see, and it in fact opened up not just opportunities for the mission footprint, but connections to the larger city and to the river wall. And so we were compelled by how the mission footprint could become a, more of um, a figure or an object in the space, which is now covered over um, by a number of things. And so this project area has turned into something that we're defining by as three components of the city's experience. One is the mission footprint, shown in red, um, the 1930s garden, which has significance of its own and its components, and this gold area that is the opportunity to create a new plaza de Valero that is um, unencumbered by a vehicle and it can become a major civic space um, for the people. But the fence around it, the people can't get to it. The idea of improving the Al Alamo district, we realize, must be about its vitality, that it can be pedestrian friendly, and must of all be comfortable to bring people. To, to have people return and to be a great place for uh, visitors as well. So there were a number of things that we identified here that are important to achieve that vision. One, to reduce vehicular access and increase public safety. Second, to connect to the river walk and to other reference, other San Antonio uh, cultural assets to provide a generous area for gathering and public expression, to catalyze future downtown development, and to cool the plaza with large areas of shade. So here, I want to, uh, this is explaining this idea that this part of downtown can actually uh, become part of the entire cultural um, fabric um, of the downtown area that we were interested here in the study of 
the Alamo Plaza today, which is about 1.9 acre site, um, but that really with the mission footprint recovered, it would be a three acre site. It would then join with the three acre garden and then the fact that the area south of the mission is three and a half acres. So we're getting a nine and a half acre uh, civic space here. And we're, um, we're also just showing you with the um, uh, residents around San Antonio here from uh, the Pearls Farmers Market, which is only an eighth of an acre, and then the main plaza, which is three acres. We'll show a number of images tonight about how we achieve comfort, but certainly through shade and the plantations of trees. And we um, only have to look at the river walk to understand the benefits of shade and um, how to provide comfort and a whole host of other um, climate issues. Um, we're comparing this to the condition right now of uh, North Alamo Street um, as it exists today. And so here is an illustration of this vision that um, these this nine and a half acres uh, of the city all revolving around the Alamo um, and extending out the stories of the Alamo from the mission footprint to a bigger area. Um, so we're uh, <coughs> walking through and did, um, show the way this set of experiences might feel um, as you move through um, this part of downtown. This is the walk up from Commerce Street, which is headed north toward the Alamo. The idea that this is a pervasive planting of trees that would bring uh, shaded uh, areas or not only walking, but um, spilling out of cafe terraces um, and a host of other events. Um, here we're showing the um, location, proposed location, one location for the cenotaph that is the center piece of a new plaza. Here is um, moving around the corner of the river center and uh, showing this um, view of the cenotaph with this direct connection to the front of the Alamo. No. 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 This is a, um, a view of the Alamo that you don't have to go. And I think this is a really um, compelling component um, in the um, in the whole project. Uh, you don't have this view today. Um, but we realized that in the removal of the Ripley's building, that this view, I have my back toward the river, but this view from Lasoria Street. No, we don't tear down the historic up, village of San Antonio. Up, um, God damn it. This pretty remarkable view of the Alamo. It also reveals the southwest corner of the original mission footprint that is now uh, no longer available. What's shown on the left here is just an indication of the new museum and that this would actually become uh, the entrance uh, area to uh, the new museum. Here is Houston Street um, that is um, pedestrianized but uh, offering this particular um, view of the barracks and the Alamo uh, fully uh, revealed. And um, on the opposite side, uh, in front of the Emily Morgan Hotel, this is showing how um, the hotel could move uh, out from uh, its restaurant area and that this is actually expanded in this case and becomes larger, um, but as you can tell from this uh, image, that the masonry wall that exists there now from the 1930s. This is a um, rendering of actually standing in of uh, the recovered uh, mission footprint, um, where the church and barracks are fully revealed, um, and that the um, 
uh, idea of populating the edges of this great space would give retreats, would give shade for educational programs and school groups to gather and everyone to go through the interpretive programs that are proposed uh, for the plaza. So I want to talk about like, what it takes uh, in this case to achieve um, the mission footprint. Um, this is a really key thing because we, we frankly didn't know whether we could convincingly do this. Um, we were given the charge uh, within uh, this, uh, this context. And so we identified four things here that we tested and we believe makes for uh, the, the case that this can be retrieved. Um, the first one is to delineate a zone for reverence and learning. This is where all the educational programs uh, that move out from the museum galleries would take place. And so this idea is to lower the ground plane's dimensions protecting the archaeological layer, but removing really the 20th century interventions of the, the streets and traffic islands. Um, the second is to reveal as much of the mission footprint as possible. And wherever we do this, we're proposing here that we inscribe the architectural footprint in the ground. There are no walls proposed. We're not recreating anything. We are just interpreting the architectural form of the mission for everybody uh, to understand as they uh, move along both sides of the footprint and look at the ground. Then there's this uh, idea that trees can help um, assert the original volume of space of the mission, and by that I mean uh, of course, it was out in the open at the time. Now the city has grown around it. And how do we bring uh, kind of internal focus so that people are held within the mission footprint? And one way to do that is to actually populate the edges in form with informal plantings of trees and, um, and in a way, um, block or screen uh, the city and bring focus to the, to the footprint. And then the last thing is to tell them all the stories, which we describe, you know, really are about 500 years of history um, that could be uh, layered through the site. Um, this is just going to explain the idea of lowering the ground plane with um, 6 times 16 inches, let's say, and that the, this kind of urban fill layer that's happened over the last 100 years um, is what's really being removed, and the potential archaeological uh, site is protected, and also um, really all of the site in making any of these improvements is approached as an archaeological site and future archaeological digs. Um, the blue area is showing the footprint. Um, of the art the mission architecture that is inscribed in the ground. This is a view from the, um, the I'm going to call it the mission uh, compound or court, uh, plaza looking toward um, a plaza, a new plaza de Valero, and how that edge um, becomes the place for entry and for seating and for walking on both sides of the mission footprint. This again shows the, the approach from Houston Street. So this gets into the really the issue of the West Edge, which I want to go through with y'all very carefully. Um, this is showing the four options that are being considered, and they um, go the full range here from the upper left, retaining the block, the architectural block that exists. Yes. And making it, um, converting it, or somehow incorporating it into a museum. Yes. All the way to um, retaining the Crockett facade as a certain component of the new museum and removing um, the other building. No. 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 Uh, 
Um, this is the one that considers retaining uh, all of the uh, block and um, what is um, noticeable here is that, as you all know, the, um, the western edge of the mission is underneath this. Um, and so that would not be able to be interpreted. Um, but the uh, idea shown in gray is that uh, the museum would be uh, adapted to this um, uh, facade and that the view from uh, the plaza would be a, a familiar one. That yes. is the um, set of buildings, the pocket palace, and the Woolworth building. This is an idea. Um, I'm working with the committees that um, retains the facade of the building. Lower the but, side, please. Uh, retains the facade of the building from Crockett to Woolworth on the corner, but allows the reading uh, behind it, steps the museum back to the west, and allows the reading of the uh, west edge of the footprint. I didn't mention that I don't think I did, um, but the west edge of the mission footprint actually holds some of the most significant stories, um, which is why we wanted to be very careful about how we consider this west edge. Um, the great interpretive moments here, um, and I, I can get into that later. Um, so this was another option, and then a third option, well, and what this does, which we were very pleased about, is that a public promenade could be created along the full west side of the Alamo, the mission footprint, outside of its edge, so that this traffic, or the pedestrian movement north-south, would move along and would have these views of the historic site. This is the view that you would have from the mission um, in, in the middle of the plaza where we're showing the facades retained, but the promenade uh, behind and the museum uh, behind, and yet the understanding of um, the uh, west edge, uh, which is the light blue line that moves along that uh, promenade in between the facade and the new museum. This was a, another idea that came about, which was that the uh, Woolworth and Plus Palace facades and buildings, their volumes were actually interpreted, that this has been done in a number of places, um, where um, the uh, actual, you mark the uh, edge of the 20th century building and then reveal the layers that are under the ground there um, behind it. And so this is not a design at all. We're just trying to indicate here that there's a way to create a kind of scaffolding that uh, evokes that uh, facade and that the museum at this west edge should be fully interpreted. And then this is um, this is the uh, one that shows the lease of the buildings along the west edge. It preserves Crockett. It uses Crockett as both the main entry from the museum into the historic site. It is the circulation corridor for the museum. It allows the north-south promenade, the public promenade, open 24/7 to move all along that west edge, and then for the re for the interpretation of that west uh, west edge. And here's a view looking at um, that, where the Crockett facade is preserved, and then the public promenade with what we're just ghosting in is a museum building uh, behind. And then returning to the feeling of this um, plaza, uh, the mission footprint uh, fully revealed in the views um, of the Alamo and the Vera. The plaza, this is for this uh, intensive use of the plaza for uh, programming, um, school groups, reenactments, and all. So then I want to mention here the big issue of access 
and how we have been uh, thinking about this um, as a way of balancing and reconciling what is a museum, what will be an open air museum that will have all these artifacts and stories uh, for the visitor and the everyday citizens use uh, as they move through this area of the city. Um, and so there's several uh, thoughts here on this, and this is um, just one of them. Um, sorry, I, I'm jumping, I, I missed one um, opportunity here which we've been thinking about because there's so many layers of history. This is one that just interprets the Southwest Corner, which we know is very important. But uh, interestingly, it, we're showing on the right that it could both reveal the platform music in the background, um, but it could also reveal the mission era uh, footprint, architectural footprint. So this is a really, I think, real compelling um, thought that we could show uh, from the battle uh, time that uh, what the construction materials and techniques were for these ramps and uh, platform. But this is the one area uh, where we think it's possible for the public to get to the level that is actually the height of the original mission, um, which of course was used uh, strategically in the battle. This is another idea for the West Edge. Um, this is if it is revealed, um, where some of the significant events, like uh, Travis writing uh, the victory or death letter, um, could be uh, understood as part of the mission buildings. And then, um, the, all together, this layering of interpretation, so I'll just go through a few of these from the Native American burial grounds, which we know um, are, are learning even more about their locations uh, under um, Houston Street and North Alamo Street, um, the Palisade, the Southwest Corner, um, the main gate, um, Mexican cavalry positions, the understanding of the importance of the North Wall. Um, so this is just part of the interpreted possibilities here uh, to tell the full 500-year story. This is the introduction into the issue of access and organizing the visitor experience. We're showing here the possibility of seven, let's say, openings that would be used to allow the public and uh, visitors through um, this uh, uh, enclosure. And what the uh, larger referring dot represents is the idea that the entry, the main entry to the historic site is through the Crockett Building uh, that is directly linked to the museum galleries and the public promenade on the west side of the Alamo. Um, and so uh, one of the uh, diagrams here is talking about during museum hours from 10 to 5, let's say, uh, on the days the museum is open, that there is this flexible uh, option to uh, bring everyone uh, whether you are a, uh, a visitor or a citizen, it's open and free, and, uh, but everyone moves through the main entry to the historic site. This would be very much dependent on programs, uh, the interpretive programs and special events. If they're particularly uh, intensive, this would be perhaps an option. We're really looking here in addressing flexibility, how the museum can function and protect things and do their programming with school children and all um, on this plaza uh, and co with um, citizens. And so one of the uh, alternatives is that these other openings can um, be open for both times outside of the museum hours and if the museum uh, program of the plaza 
is uh, not particularly intensive, there's flexibility here in how this can be uh, organized. And then when the museum is closed after 4, 10 a.m. and after 5 p.m., um, all of these openings uh, would be open and the black dot, black dotted line is just showing that um, we know that we would have to have some um, similar to what's there today, a posting chain situation that is um, uh, how the rangers protect the artifacts uh, all through the night. Now I want to talk about this edge and its really um, importance because this edge really changes all the way around it. Um, and we think that is, we, we, the idea here is to let this edge be informed by its adjacent conditions. Um, so I'm going to start on the south side with the idea that there is an extension of the 1930s garden it would move across the south, defining the edge to uh, the plot of the mission footprint. And that those openings would occur in that uh, planting, and they would have gates. And so this is one uh, about four openings there between plot, the new Plaza Valera, and the um, historic site. Then as you move along the west edge with the new museum and that long promenade that is open at all times as part of the city sidewalk, that the 42-inch um, rail, much as you'd see in um, any public place uh, about an edge or a set, um, is for people to lean against and then look back over um, both the footprint and back to the Alamo and there. And so here's a view from that I showed you earlier, but just to emphasize um, how that edge would be, would be formed. And then this is the view from Houston Street. You're seeing the glass railing there that is um, keeping people um, at that edge. And then in uh, times when the museum uh, flexibility is opening it up for Houston Street, pedestrians to flow uh, down to the plaza and up on the other side as well for uh, the hotel in New Morgan. Then as you move to the north edge, uh, the hotel gives and the federal uh, post office, this is showing the idea of keeping a very generous sidewalk for all the commercial interests there. Um, and that you are looking down um, on the lower ground. And um, in this case, on the north edge, marking one of, one of the most important um, uh, events uh, of the battle. And then as you move around the garden, I've already addressed uh, this as the uh, idea that the uh, fence, a fence would be used instead of the masonry wall to um, provide protection to the garden and the artifacts and um, thread through um, a garden. This you've seen. And so I want to move to uh, Plaza de Valero, which we think is one of the most, could become one of the most significant civic spaces here. Um, so I'm now moving south from the historic site and showing that it is um, defined by the centerpiece of the cenotaph and this pervasive planting of trees for shade and comfort. So this is um, five steps that we think are important here. No. Restore and relocate the cenotaph. No. 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 Provide large roads for gatherings no. and public expression. Enhance connectivity. No. Activate the space all the time, day and evening, and plan to preserve progressive growth, growth of shade trees. We think these are five things that would really um, establish a very powerful uh, thought. We don't move a war So here is uh, the zeroing in on the plan um, of it. And then just revisiting these images here that are um, shown now in the evening um, with people gathering. Um, we think this is an opportunity. 
opportunity to fully interpret uh, the Zen attack no, you know, in the And then um, showing it also as an area uh, much as is uh, used today for I want to talk a minute about the importance of reconnecting this project or connecting uh, the project area to the river wall. And here is an idea that um, in looking at the large plaza where uh, the uh, Torch of Friendship exists, it is, uh, as you know, a very large page, um, surface area at the grade of the city streets. Here we're saying the opportunity is to make a more efficient intersection and open up the levels of the river to the city uh, sidewalk. So as you move along Commerce, as you move along um, uh, the extension of Osoria Street, you would be looking down into uh, the river and that those folks coming up from the river would be able to get on the walk to the uh, north to the Alamo and then those coming from the New Hemisphere and those areas to the south would take this bridge over the river and also join up with the promenade to the Alamo. There's a lot of traffic study and data that has been collected and uh, has gone into this study and understanding how this would really work, how it would impact uh, the transportation routes. And, um, uh, Release the findings! For the, um, uh, for the uh, historic site to become pedestrianized. I'm not going into this in depth, but I'm showing the proposal of making Lasoria a two-way street. Um, it's going to be a surprise to you all to find that Lasoria on the actual street right away is much wider than one thinks. show that um, this could become a major north-south route through town connecting Broadway and uh, to the interstate. We know that the parades are a very significant part of this part of downtown.
of the day and the evening, and that the, um, the uh, light uh, at night will be important. We're showing here how the mission footprint could read as a very powerful um, element during the evening and really bring a kind of um, uh, dignity and solemnity and reverence that um, is part of the whole goal here. Here's that view again at night uh, from the Soria Street. Um, and this is um, this returning to this importance of uh, planting a grove of shade trees. And then ending here on, again, this vision of bringing this part of the city to more fully tell the stories of 500 years of your heritage. Um, and so I'm, I'm just returning to these three ideas that are the um, measures of success. Um, understanding the Alamo not as a building, but rather as a place, making it a place of reverence and learning, and then improving the whole district to be vital, pedestrian friendly, and comfortable. We think if we can do this, that we will have a measure of success. Thank you all very much. Moist. 
And so some of that stone is falling, and there's, there's some issues with that, as well as other issues that were identified by the original master plan team. So there is some work that's getting ready to get started to make sure that we preserve those artifacts and preserve the, the very historic buildings that we know we have at the Alamo. Okay, so let's see. Um, Thanks to Centennial Commission considered the restoration of the Alamo, the Alamo Museum, and the Alamo Cenotaph to be one of the most important projects of the Commission to appropriately celebrate the Centennial of Texas Independence. If the Texas Centennial Commission would have had the opportunity in the 1930s to create an overall plan of the Alamo, they would have done more than just tear down the buildings on the east side of the plaza of the Great Park. I think they would have approved of your efforts. I know I do. Okay. And so that's an important comment in that uh, some of the things that happened in the 1930s really have, have impacted a lot of what we're doing today. And as it's pointed out, we know that we have gardens to the east side of the Cenotaph as well. And so the part of the planning is showing that there's a lot of, lot of things uh, that were done back then that we're trying to uh, adjust today. Like, for example, the gardens itself. Because there's stone walls around the gardens, many people are confused and think that that's actually part of the mission. That's not the original mission. And as you can see in the designs, those stone walls around the garden will be removed. So, okay. Uh, well, I mean, you know, these, these, are, these are, again, these are non historic walls, and, and we think that that is, that is a, a good option. We, we are maintaining the garden, it's just the stone walls are, are not original to the site. Okay, so, okay, we'll skip to the next slide. This is the location of many that died at this time. Remove this, same as digging up graves. Well, we, you know, we, we definitely respect the site, and we want to be very careful. We have a team of experts. We have archaeologists, historians, and a lot of folks that have really worked very hard to make sure that we are sensitive to the site. And that is important to all of us. It's, it's part of making sure that we're setting the table for all the stories at the Alamo site. Again, the Alamo is a place, not a building. One of the extra trees. If you want to copy, follow the footprint, like you say, there were no trees. That's true. So part, part, part of the discussion, that's a great question, right? Why, why weren't trees? Well, this is part of the response from last time that, that there wasn't enough trees in the, in the plaza. It was a hot space. And we feel that, that this is a, a, an option that's response to part of that, as well as trying to create a space they can, they can try to help create a separate space from a bustling downtown. It, it actually helps to sort of separate uh, visually and sound to create that serene place we're looking to create. This is Alamo Plaza, not Central Park. Is this for political reasons? Yes. If so, it is the worst portrayal of America in our country. Yep. It's good or bad. It's so This, this is this is not uh, for political reasons. This is really something that we're trying to we're, we're, we're trying to be methodical and thoughtful about an important historic site, and we want to tell all the stories. And, and it's difficult, and it's really that, that we attack uh, we tackle this with experts. Politicians are making these decisions. We're we're we're, we're, we're asking the experts to help us.
uh, layout, at least currently. So this is Doug McDonald, the CEO of the album. Hey, he's the same guy that was laughing at you ladies when you were booing, too. That's yes. right. Yes. Yeah. 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 So the um, the restoration plan of the Alamo is we've done a lot of assessments as part of the last part of the national planning process. And we what we looked at in that project was we looked at all the stones and what's been the deterioration. So if you talk to our conservator, Pam Rosser, who's been really studying this structure for uh, 20 years. And she can show you, you go inside the church, you can look at the black paper before. You can see the accumulation of walls that are falling down. And so we have less of the Alamo every day. And our goal is to preserve the Alamo for the next generation and the generation after that. We need to pay our way to reverse it. So our plan is to go through a process and we've got a selection. Can I help you? I'd like to ask a question. Ask okay. it. Who owns the real estate? There's different real estates that own there. Who owns the property? The city and the state own the real estate. There's others too. There are private businesses own real estate. So you mean uh, the real estate we have in the plan here? There's about three owners. So. And dollars are public protected as one of the others too. They're not. Yes. In 1883, they bought the land that's there. It belongs to the state of Texas. No, we no, Texans. No. The, uh, I'm talking about the Alamo, not to the daughters. They bought a portion of it. The state of Texas got another portion. Okay, so I want to keep I want to keep the conversation going. So we'll move on. I, I, so if you can answer the question, we'll move on. The third restoration project uh, will is in so on the 20th. It was yesterday. So. All the RFQs are supposed to be submitted. And so at the GLO, we have, there's been firms that actually apply to start the process. The process will start sometime this year. And we will, the process will become an analysis process for about a year and a half. Because we need to go through a whole year of watching what the weather patterns do, what the seasonal effects are, to determine exactly what's causing the destruction of the church. And so without that process, about a year and a half, the restoration will start after that. Thank you. Okay, the carpet block built in 1883 by William and Albert Maverick, restored in 1980. It's been the queen of the Alamo Plaza for 135 years. Do not destroy or repurpose. Yeah. Go back. Please be transparent about how my tax dollars are being spent. Go there. Yeah, how about the shadows? Are you familiar? Okay, site plan. I'm a native of San Antonio. I believe the plans that have presented so far creates a disrespect to our county. to create more reverence for, for the Alamo and group reverence for the site and all the history that, that has occurred there. And so it's important that we talk about this. And as you can see, there's, there's a lot of traditions, a lot of history, a lot of things that have occurred. And so we're trying to make room for all of it. And it's it's not gonna it's not gonna be that easy, but we're we're working through it, and that's why we're having these meetings. I think it's important for us to to have these and talk about the input we're we're recording here today. Part of these questions are gonna be up on the Alamo.org website with answers. How do you justify plans from no Texas and non-San Antonio firms to take our money and do what they want without regard for this? Hey. Yeah.
but we are trying to find the best experts who can who can help provide the best plan for an important site like the Alamo. That's why we're doing it. We've had experts for Europe, Mexico, all over the United States, and here locally as well. So the original, you saw the original master plan, and you can see there's been some adjustments based on the feedback and comments from before. And of course, that's what we're doing here again today. So we know that we're going to have many more rounds of this, but that's why we have some of those adjustments. When were the citizens of San Antonio allowed to vote on the issue? So the process that we set up is, is involving communities like this. But we also have Citizens Advisory Committee members that are representing every district of the city and are appointed by the mayor as well, mayor and city council. And we have people that are appointed by the general land office because we're in partnership with the state of Texas, the city of San Antonio, the Alamo Endowment. And that is an important part of our process as we develop this process the, the, the members of the Citizens Advisory Committee to uh, really take this responsibility very seriously. And we know at the management committee level, which is two members from, from these, which is myself, uh, City Manager Cheryl Scully, who is here tonight. Thank you, Cheryl, for being here. Two members from the general land office representing the state, uh, which is Hector Ryan. Yes, and uh, Brian Preston. Set up. Of course, that goes up to the executive committee that is voted that, that has veto power at that point, which is the mayor of San Antonio and the general land office commissioner George P. Bush. of the Alamo at sunset. So, yes, that's an easy one. Committed, yeah, we can do that. From an ADA perspective, how close will people with walking mobility limitations be able to get? Is it realistic to expect people to walk blocks or miles? That's a great question. Uh, you know, part of what when we say we want to be a welcoming site, a site that talks about all the, the stories and histories uh, of the site. Uh, accessibility is so important to us. We want everybody to get to enjoy this. And, and certainly can tell you, yes, we take this very, very seriously. And, and downtown has experienced a real shift in, in terms of accessibility. Our sidewalks are more accessible than ever. City Hall is being renovated with a new ramp that allows the front steps of City Hall truly be accessible to all. I want to thank Board Park for that partnership. And so as we do this project, we know we're going to make every bit of this accessible to every every age range and every um, uh, uh, accessible person, uh, every accessibility range uh, that we can. Okay, let me ask a quick question. 
So, uh, if, so I'll tell you what. We'll we'll go ahead and, and make because I just do want to make sure that we're addressing all these questions. So, if we could just make a deal, what we'll do is we'll get through these questions, and then we'll get to some some, some questions from the audience, and then we'll go back to some of these questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The higher the higher is restricted to prevent any shadow across the face of the Alamo at sunset. I think that was part of the previous question. Of course, you know, we, we're very sensitive to that. Where is the money coming from? I think I've answered that question already. Who is a specialist on the Alamo Plaza's for the Indian burials? So I think uh, Ramon Vaz is, is, is here. And, you know, again, it's very important. I know, Ramon, would you like to say a few, few things? As a citizen advisor, he's part of the citizen advisory committee as well. Yes, but we're, we're working hard to make sure that the, the site is open 24 7. Of course, as we build a museum, we also know that part of the museum is part of an outdoor museum, part of an outdoor space and programming. And how we make that work is an operational uh, strategy and commitment that I leave to the expert. But that we're very much committed to a space that, that, is, that is open to the public 24 7. And that is, that is something that we have taken to heart. Why have guidelines or principles if you don't adhere to them? More money wasted with plans that the public doesn't want. So, the Michigan Guiding Principles, we believe, are being adhered to. That's why the Citizens Advisory Committee, which created the Michigan Guiding Principles, are helping us with this project and making sure that we're addressing these very things. But they're handpicked by y'all guys. Please save the project lot. The Alfred Giles building is an architectural treasure. and not be responsive to your constituents. A, a very good question. Again, I, I, I would point out that, that there is a balance. Uh, this partnership with the state of Texas and the Alamo Balance, and as we're trying to balance the approaches and balance the, the different opinions that we might have, that's part of it. So know that I do feel that we're, we're doing everything we can. Cheryl Scully and I sit on the, uh, on the management committee level, and of course the Citizens Advisory uh, represents the city very well. And as well as the executive committee that is made up by the mayor and the general land office. So the, the city is well represented in this plan. There's no Idea for this that does not close Alamo Street. Amen. Yeah. 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 Okay. Or not And Phil Back, he is on the Citizens Advisory Committee. Good evening. I don't know that I per se have a plan, but I have seen other plans that have been floated by local experts uh, that are well respected in their fields, such as Madison Smith, David Lay, Bill Shaw, people who are specifically in the public to the public, we will be looking at those and uh, trying to come up with the best path forward. Okay, and, thank you, Bill. The idea has been floated to tear down the Palace Theater building, but yet your plan 
is for building a theater. Why do both? The palace was John Santico's first theater in this town. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, I, I think that's a great point. I think the, the, the team is, is currently studying the significance through evidence-based research on this. Okay, Doug would like to answer this. The theater part of the Palace Theater was actually where the Hyatt parking garage is, so all that was a little bit years ago. Okay. All right, yes, sir. Yeah, Laura. 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 Good to see you. <laughs>
were shown these accommodative routes for the parade, and we can all probably agree that the route behind the Alamo is absolutely unacceptable. Woo! But the one route that was probably the most appealing, and I use that term very loosely, the least worst. Um, it came off of Lasoya onto Crockett, and then at the Alamo Plaza point. Mm -hmm. That point is at least a football field length away and 45 degrees, more or less, from the front of the church of the Alamo. That just doesn't work. No, no exactly. <laughs> The object of the Battle of Flowers is both educational and patriotic. It's designed to teach the history of our state and to keep alive the patriotic traditions of Texas and San Antonio. One of the guiding principles of the Alamo Plaza Advisory Committee is to embrace the continuum of history to foster understanding and healing. Let me underline that. Embrace the continuum of history. Curiously, where we both should be in sync, we're currently at odds. We too want to follow that principle of embracing the continuum of history. It is at the core of our mission statement. The parade is more than balloons, clowns, floats, simple bouquet ceremonies that some people call. It's for the people of San Antonio, for the people of Texas, and even those outside of our great state. This is a part of living history. It's the way we remember and honor our dead. Every entry to the parade brings a fresh floral tribute, each of which is reverently laid on the lawn in front of the church. It is the very heartbeat, the pulse, the soul of the parade. And it is the reason we gather to honor the fallen heroes of the battles of San Jacinto and the Alamo. And it all began over 127 years ago in front, directly in front of the Alamo. Not behind it, not to the side of it, not 45 degrees angle, but directly in front of the Alamo. And that is where we want to stay. It is a historic route and we respectfully ask that you both follow your own guiding principles, honor this historic parade, and make changes necessary which will allow this to happen.
We're not going to have offices and things like that in the museum building. That will keep the building a little smaller. We're going to put those in other buildings that are, frankly, a lot less expensive builds, and we'll actually work for staffing uh, your drawer purchases just as well. You, you, you. Use the existing buildings for the museum. Don't tip Where is all the money from the museum? We hate buildings. Okay, so where is all the money coming from, coming from the, for the museum? That is, that is a building that is owned by the state, and we, we, we can have a simple explanation about where the money is coming from the museum. The, and that's, the question is, what happens to the money that's collected there today? That's the question. Is that money is all deposited in the state comptroller? Uh, I think we get like 24 hours to transfer all the money to the state comptroller. And that's appropriated by the legislature back to the exclusive use of the Alamo. And that's earned revenue and some donations are will primarily fund all the activities at the Alamo each day. So what's going to happen when the legislature decides to treat the money? Legislature can always do whatever they want to. So what's going to happen with that, with your plan, if they restrict the money with the whole plan? Does it kill the plan or what does it do? It does it affect the overall plan. I mean, we can do whatever the legislature can purpose, so we cannot, we're not superior to the legislature. So. Exactly. Yeah. The next lady has a question. So, um, let her speak. She, she's not with us. She's not with us. <laughs> let her have a question. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, I live in District 9 in San Antonio. I'm a proud fifth generation Texan, and I respectfully state that those individuals who are planning these sweeping changes to our downtown landscape, including our precious Alamo, do not understand our history, our culture, or our passion for traditions. Amen. San Antonio is a city strong in faith and traditions, and I trust that we will prevail in having Amen. our voices heard and sincerely acknowledged in a desire for our community to remain what we want it to be. Amen. Amen. Yeah. city and we are trying to make sure that we hear all those voices of many, many diverse cultures, many diverse histories, and we will be sensitive to all that. Thank you. I remove the 20th century elements, but then the plan is to build a newer museum. You are cherry picking on rules and principles in your plot. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so that goes back to the museum. I think Doug kind of answered part of that. I think we're still in the process of how we get that Get that done. Well, the new museum had the Confederate Regiment by of the Alamo City Guards back on the yeah. yeah. I think that's a, a question that, that Doug can answer. Yeah. 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 So, the Stars and Brothers Confederate flag is on display every day at the Alamo uh, in, the, in the courtyard, and there's no one of the six flags were attached to there's no place to change it. Well, the new one. That's not the one that flew over the Alamo during 1861 to 1865. There was a Confederate regiment that said Texas Light Infantry and Artillery that was called Alamo City Guards. They had their own flag. They had a copy of it made, given to the museum to be put on display in the Alamo. Where is it now, and will it be on display at this new museum? during the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> You'll actually see every one of the periods of the Alamo as a fort, starting from when it was a Spanish fort to a Mexican fort, to the became a Texas fort, to the became a Mexican fort, to the Texas fort, to the U.S. Army fort, to the Confederate fort, and then again to the U.S. Army fort. And so we show every evolution since it was uh, second rise until when the Spanish Army made it Alamo, and that it was made by the Spanish Army actually, and we show that all the way through uh, contemporary until it became uh, Fort Sam. Thank you, Doug. Okay, so we got about six and a half minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and push to go back to the crowd. Yes, man, you guys put your hand raised a lot. I'd like to see if we can have all the books brought back that were taken away from the Alamo and 
put down there in Texas A&M, draws bringing up bass to it. We have to study the data at the yellow. No, we're not playing with that. So, okay, okay, great point. Yes, sir. on the Alamo ground, lived on the Alamo ground, and he also died on the Alamo ground at the chapel at the age of 27 years old. So when you think about what route you want to take for the parade and you want to honor fallen soldiers, his statue is there on La Soya Street, which would make sense if you want to honor a fallen soldier or many of them or all of them. Those Alamo grounds are sacred and should be reverenced as they deserve. I have never gone to Arlington Cemetery or the World War I or World War II uh, memorials and ever dealt with hecklers, streetlers, streetlers, prostitutes, or anyone else like that. I am actually pleased that something may be able to be done so we can have a world-class historical destination for our city. It will bring many things. It will bring many people here. It will bring jobs. It will bring a lot of wonderful things for our city that we finally deserve. I don't know if this will be able to happen again. I have children on my father, on my husband's side who are Native American. I can tell them about that history. I can tell them about my ancestor that was born, lived, and died on the Alamo grounds. So while you may be opposed to many things, I think there are some compromises that we can all make so everyone can be happy. We want to make sure, again, we welcome all comments. And I think that's important, of course, we, we want to be welcoming of all issues, so we certainly appreciate that. I'm going to go to this gentleman. I, I want to go back to the criteria for removing things from the album. Y'all talk about removing the walls. Y'all yeah. talk about removing the walls that the WPA built because it's confusing. You can't right. tell what's historic and what's and what was built in the 20th century. By that same token, why isn't the roof of the album being the church being removed? That was built by the WPA. Or even the parapet Thank you. built in the 1840s when it was first roof. There's a pick and choose of what's being removed. There's, there's discussions about what's what's good for for the, the church itself. It's a, it's a concrete roof. Is it, is it something that, that, that helps or damages the building? That is being handled by some, some technical experts right now. We know that, that is something that is very, very sensitive. So uh, I don't think we're picking and choosing. I think what we're, we're doing is trying to be very, very careful with a very significant artifact, which is the church itself. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am, right over there. Um, just have a question about the cenotaph. Um, is there a reason why you want to move it from one side of the plaza to the other? I mean, I haven't understood that. Yeah, so the original master plan discussed relocating the cenotaph over yeah. to the river walk itself, uh, over off of Commerce Street. And, and now you can see the adjustments have been made to move it much closer, 500 feet away to the south. And so, as was explained by, by the interpretive team, you, one of the reasons was to, to make sure that we recapture the mission footprint and we can tell all the stories of, of the animal. And so, the, 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 the uh, cenotaph also needs repair, and as part of the, the work to repair it, that would be the Do not like that idea. No. So if there's just some 
big reason why you're going to repair it and move it over here, then you get, we need to rethink that. So, so, so what I can tell you is we, we've had countless, countless meetings, and as you pointed out, yes, in, in some groups that, that we have, uh, you know, don't move the sentence out, and we in other, in other groups we have moved the sentence out. So we're taking all that into account. We're also trying to be uh, thoughtful to all the layers of history. We're trying to be thoughtful to a plan that accommodates all the layers of history we have on the site. And so, okay, we'll take, we'll take two more questions. And let's see. Yes, ma'am. Okay. First off, I, Go I commend first. anybody's effort to preserve the structure of the Alamo Church. I commend that. However, in looking at the design concept, it neither reflects the culture of San Antonio and our history with Mexico, Spain, and the numerous other countries that we have been associated with. I do not see any resemblance there. I also think it looks like any other park that you might see in an inner city. It really is very common looking, I think. And I'm sorry to the designers. I know they have spent a great deal of time on this. But it is common. There is nothing unique about it. But lastly, as a member of the Battle of Flowers, I would like to say 127 years of history has a footprint. And we are here to honor the heroes of the Alamo, as well as San Jacinto. Woo! Do not tamper with it. So we're going to take all the comments and we're going to be responding to them on the website, theelmo.org. And, and so as we get into the next round, you're going to see that there's going to be some adjustments. Again, some, some may not be uh, in agreement with, with uh, how you feel about the sentence act. And there might be some other issues that we move forward. So we would really need to do as much of that as possible. So, uh, You ought to see that we're completely opposed to most of these plans. This is a, a, a city that's different from Austin and Dallas and Houston because we preserve our old buildings. We don't tear them down to build a cement block. You can put the museum in those old buildings and repurpose them. There's a lot of there's a lot of museums that are multi story in this country. Don't tear those buildings down or leave a facade like a like a movie set. We want to keep those old buildings. So again, we're 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 out of time, guys. I just want to.